So thank you for inviting me to speak here today on Heritage Foods. My name is Amy Van Skoik and I'm part of a farm here in Alachua County called Frog Song Organics. We grow a diversified range of organic vegetables on about 60 acres. We also produce some chickens for eggs and we also raise pastured pork. Um, so we raise the pigs out on pasture in combination with our vegetables. So um, we do that in order to try to use regenerative practices to help the animals steward the land and improve our soil over time. So this presentation um, really gave me the opportunity to think about the story that I've come to tell myself and others about how did I get into farming. I get that question a lot, like, oh, how did you get into this? You know, why did you start this farm? And I always told people, oh, well, I didn't come from a farming background. I didn't come from a farming family. And then I really kind of had to stop and think about the impact that my grandmother had on me and that I actually was exposed to a lot of the things that I became interested in and I'm doing now, but just not on a commercial basis. Um, so I'm a transplant originally from Wisconsin. I, that's where I was born. And I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, in a suburban neighborhood, went to, you know, your typical public schools, swam at the neighborhood rec center. Um, and even though we didn't have a lot of land, we did have this little sunny patch on the side of our house that I grew up in. And that's where my grandmother always kept a garden. So she, until, you know, just the very last few years of her life, she always was putting seeds in the ground and taking care of something and you know, growing something. And it was just a way that she liked to occupy her time. And I think she really valued um, doing something productive with her hands. And I think that's something that I really picked up on. Um, I brought in something special to show you all just because I wanna honor my grandmother. This is the wok and the spatula that cooked most of my childhood meals that my grandmother cooked them in. Um, and I still have it and use it today, which it's kind of amazing to have any appliance last that long. Um, but it plugs in and you can really, you know, cook almost anything in it. Um, but I really treasure it now, especially since my grandmother's no longer with us. Um, her name was Nan Hoi Li, and she originated in southern China and then eventually moved to Hong Kong and then eventually to the United States. And so when I was four years old, my grandma came to live with us and help take care of my younger sister. And she never really intended to stay, but um, she ended up staying in the United States um, the rest of her life to help take care of us and then eventually other grandchildren um, in uh, California. But growing up with her, what I saw a lot, and it's, it's funny because I just never really thought about the significance of it until kind of later in life. Um, I always you know, grew up seeing little jars of seeds with um, you know, little tiny paper labels taped onto them with writing in Chinese that you know, I didn't know what it said because I never learned to read or write in Chinese, um, but I could speak a little bit of Cantonese with her. And um, you know, I would see all these little jars of seeds and I'd see her carefully, you know, pulling the tops off of the plants after they had dried. Um, she would tend her garden and grow a lot of different things, like specifically there's a vegetable called choy sum, which uh, refers to the heart of the, the stem of the vegetable. Another one called gai lan, which is like a Chinese broccoli. If you've ever had it, maybe like a dim sum restaurant. Um, that's one of my personal favorites. Um, she also would grow things like cilantro, you know, some scallions um, and the yard long beans. Has anyone seen those or like like that. Um, we have some funny family stories. Um, I grew up with a lot of different uh, pets and an iguana was one of those pets. And one time, you know, we lived in St. Pete, so it was warm. We didn't get any freezes there. The iguana escaped. It lived in my backyard for a while. And one day when my grandma was picking her beans, um, there was a yelp and it was actually the tail of the iguana, not the long bean. So we have, you know, some funny little family stories like that. But um, I also grew up, this is something I talked with Sarah about when we were talking about this presentation, um, just some of the practices that I grew up with and I just never really related them to some of the environmental movements or people that study permaculture, some of the different things that, uh, concepts that people are trying to practice now, which is like nutrient recycling. So growing up, um, I had, there was a special bucket in the bathroom that my grandma would pee in and save the urine to fertilize her garden. And she would just save it up, dilute it out, water the plants. 
And, you know, my dad would tell me about, oh, yeah, well, you know, back in China, they would save the fertilizer and call it night soil and you take it out and you fertilize the garden. And, you know, so in our family, you know, we just saved the urine. But, um, you know, there's uh, you start to think about some of the cultural significance of how different um, food ways and different food practices came to be um, in Chinese cuisine. There's very little. Um, of any kind of raw vegetables consumed. Almost everything is cooked and there's different reasons for that but I'm imagining that one of those over generations is if you are reusing nutrients in that way it's a food safety thing that you have to cook your vegetables if you're not having access to clean fresh water or you're recycling nut nutrients. So I, I always think of things in like a systems kind of way and so I think, well what does this mean to this culture? What is like why are people doing it this way? Um, so um, I saw her do a lot of different um, horticultural practices, you know, besides the seed saving, also like um, air layering. She had this one plant that I have to look up. I still don't know what the American name for it is, but it had these super fragrant flowers and um, was this really special tree. And she would air layer the, the um, branches to propagate the tree and, you know, wrap all the stuff around them. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? You know, checking it out. Um, she also would just, you know, do little things like we had some pet ducks and when she'd go fishing, she'd, you know, show me how to cut the guts out of the fish and feed those to the pet ducks and basically just really maximizing all the resources that we had. And um, it was just really interesting growing up in a very mixed experience of your kind of typical American consumerist kind of you know, mainstream media culture. And then you have this really traditional input from my grandma who was growing these plants in her garden and, you know, saving seeds. And we were making pot stickers, you know, sitting around the table and like filling dumplings together. Um, she had a sewing machine and she would do alterations and make clothes for people out of our house as like a way to make some extra income. And so I feel like I really, um, it just didn't really dawn on me for a long time how much of an impact that probably had on me, just seeing people make things with their hands, be entrepreneurial, always wanting to take the resources you have, like you've got a sunny spot in your backyard, well, why aren't you growing some food in it? Um, and it wasn't presented to me that way, it was just, I just saw it happening. So I think it just took a long time for me to put it all together with maybe how it's related to what we're doing now. Um, so how I got into farming was, um, as a middle school student, I read a book about commercial um, livestock production and CAFOs and I became a vegetarian as a result and um, really started to think more about where my food uh, comes from and how it's produced and I'm no longer a vegetarian but um, that experience was really important for me to take time to learn about how the food's produced, the impact it has on the people that are involved, the environment, the animal welfare and so um, that was pretty formative and then as I later learned more about uh, raising animals and actually met people who raise animals in a more humane way, I realized, oh, there is a you know, place for all of this together and it's, it's all part of you know, how we produce food. Um, but it was a, a really, you know, again, a long learning experience. Um, so I think you know, we're here today because food is so essential to all of you know, cultures all over the world. I don't think you can really get into a culture of any place without talking about the significance of their food. And so um, I want to share with you a greeting in Cantonese, you know, that I always learned was sik fan me, which literally translates as, have you eaten yet? Like, have you eaten rice yet? So that, you know, to really kind of get down to the root of the significance of food, especially with Asian vegetables and, you know, Asian food, it's, it's a really big part of, of the culture. And um, anytime I'd visit my grandma after, you know, she didn't live with us anymore, that was, she'd always want to offer you food no matter what. Um, so, and I think, I feel like that's a pretty worldwide phenomenon for grandmas. Um, but I want to show you a few different crops that I've brought in today. Um, some of them are from my farm. Some of them I had to bring in examples because they're out of season right now. Um, but I'd love for anybody to ask any questions that they have. And what I'll do is just go through some of the different crops and just talk a little bit about them. And um, yeah, then if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, so this one is, does anybody know what this one is? The bitter melon. So this, um, this one, my grandma actually did cook a lot. I never really ate it as a kid growing up because I just 
didn't like how it tasted. It's very bitter. Um, but now, um, having learned that a lot of the plants that have those bitter tastes are actually full of a lot of compounds that are very good for you. So if you think about arugula, it's a little spicy, but full of nutrients. Dandelion greens are a little bit bitter, but they're known for cleansing the liver. Um, black Spanish radish is a very spicy, bitter radish, but again, as a, as a liver uh, supporting food. So there's a lot of foods in traditional Chinese medicine as well that are revered for different properties. So bitter melon is one of those. My grandma would just tell me, it's really good for you. You should eat it. You should boil it in different kinds of soups. Um, you can make it with a little bit of ground pork and scallions. I'll just cut it open so you can see um, what it looks like inside but it does have some seeds inside. It's a cucurbit, so related to cucumbers, cantaloupes, watermelons, they're all in the same family. Um, but the bitter melon is definitely popular in Chinese, Indian cuisine. I'm sure it's eaten in other parts of the world as well. Um, so bitter melon is probably the one I'm the least knowledgeable about because we haven't actually tried to grow it. It's definitely a hot weather, um, you know, a warmer season crop. Most cucurbits in general want warm, dry weather to be really successful. So um, for example, cucumbers, if you get too much rain, they generally die of fungal diseases unless you're using fungicides. Um, the bitter melon, it, as far as I know, it is um, a vining crop and you can trellis it um, to grow it. Um, and you would definitely want to be seeding it in, in the mid to you know early springtime and try to get that typically dry spring weather that we have although this year has been a historically record-breaking wet spring so we've had a lot of cucurbit crops actually die that we've planted out there or they're just not growing very well because it's been unseasonably cool and wet for some of the springtime so um, but yeah generally speaking cucurbits hot um, hot and dry like watermelons are adapted they're actually you know from africa i believe um, that's the center of origin. So a hot, dry climate um, is what the cucumbers, melons prefer. Um, so bok choy, there's a couple different kinds. Um, this is one of the ones that was on the list of the foods that were part of this project. So this one was being sold um, at the local Asian grocery store as um, Shanghai bok choy. This is pretty similar to what we grow at our farm, um, which we like a variety called Black Summer. And it gets a little bit bigger than this, but it's got this nice green stem, very tender. This is excellent steamed, um, stir fried. You can put it in soup. I mean, there's really no wrong way to eat it. The one thing you do have to be really careful with bok choy is when you go to prepare it, to open it up and really get in every single rib because a lot of soil will get stuck in there. Um, so I always chop it off and clean them off really, really well. Um, there's also these longer types that have the more of a crunchy white stem. In Chinese vegetables, some of the greens are actually really grown for the texture of the stem, like the gai lan, the Chinese broccoli. The fatter and most tender of a stem you can grow, that's like the ideal gai lan. The greens, they're part of it, but that's not what people are really going for. Um, whereas this one, you can see the balance of like leaf to stem is a little bit different, but they're both a type of bok choy. Um, these, the bok choy, we start it um, in transplant, so we, we seed out in trays in the um, fall and in the winter time, and then we transplant those out as they get ready. You can harvest bok choy anytime through the fall, winter, and early spring, um, but by now it's actually gotten too warm for it. Um, at our farm at least, it, it tends to not do well once you get into like April and May, and also there's um, a type of beetle called a flea beetle that really goes to town on um, bok choys, napa cabbage, um, and different brassica crops that will just tear up the bok choy. They really like it more than other things. So if you have bok choy growing out in a field and you have, you know, cabbages, they're going to destroy your bok choy first. So it's just more tender. Um, so we're not harvesting that anymore. So I did, you know, go pick this up for an example. Um, but the, uh, the bok choy is probably one of my favorite vegetables. I think I could eat bok choy pretty much every day and, and be pretty happy. Um, but these are, these are brassicas. So these are actually related to broccoli, radishes, cabbage, kale, collard greens, um, arugulas, like all of those are brassicas. So they're all gonna like somewhat similar growing conditions, but every variety is a little bit different.
So the way that I really like to make it is I would just, you know, cut the bottom off here and then maybe chop it a few times, like kind of a rough chop so you get a nice big chunk to really sink your teeth into. And then I like a light stir fry with a little bit of garlic and ginger. And I really enjoy a seasoning called ume plum vinegar, which is a very salty vinegar made from plums. Um, and I use that as the final seasoning. You can also put soy sauce or just a little bit of salt and pepper on it. Um, it's really great with um, like stir fried with shrimp or chicken or pork. Um, you can put it with tofu. Um, I also really love it in ramen noodles. So I make a lot of my own broth now, like bone broths from pork or chicken. And then I'll get a plain package of ramen noodles. So I don't use the seasoning packages that come with the like the other kinds, the little packages. I get just plain noodles and make my own broth. And then um, I'll put, you know, meat from the bones and poach an egg and then do some bok choy in there, a little sesame oil and some soy sauce. That's a meal I can eat really anytime. Um, but the bok choy is, it's one of those vegetables that it's really good, like right when you cook it and right when you serve it. Um, it's not really a great leftovers. I feel like it's, it really shines when you eat it very fresh, um, you know, when it's, it's still got a nice crunch to it. But it doesn't need much cooking, like three or four minutes, it's done. I have a couple of different um, varieties of daikon radish. So this one is your more typical white daikon radish. We grow this at the farm. You can plant this. Um, we plant this in the fall and are harvesting daikons, you know, all the way through the fall, winter, and we just finished our last crop. Normally we would still have a lot of radishes at our farm, but this year because of all the heavy rain we had, we had a lot of plantings get either get washed out or they just weren't growing well. So we're tragically like out of radishes right now. Um, normally we just have tons and tons of radishes. Um, but we grow a variety that is similar to this. It's a little bit longer, a little more tapered. Um, this one is called a purple daikon radish. So this shape is a little more typical to um, another variety that we've grown called a Korean daikon. So it's white, but it's got more of this shape and it's got a little bit more of a green shoulder. I think they're um, very sweet comparatively, not as spicy and um, very, very tender. So what I love doing with daikon radishes um, is actually enjoying them cooked. So chug, uh, cutting them into larger chunks and cooking them in a soup is really good. Um, has any, if anyone's ever been to like a dim sum restaurant, there is a special um, dish that growing up, I never put the two and two together because of translation. <laughs> um, it was called a turnip cake. And I was like, oh, it's made out of turnips, but actually it's made out of daikon radish. So turnip and radish kind of get lost in translation it's a sometimes. It goes with cake? So it is a cake, but not a sweet cake. So um, in Chinese cuisine, there's actually not a huge emphasis on sweets. There are, there are sweet desserts and there are sweets that people enjoy. Um, but in general, um, most of the dishes, there's just so many more savory dishes that are featured. So the way that this um, turnip or radish cake is made, um, I asked my grandma to show me one time uh, as an adult because my sister and I both love the turnip cake. We're like, how do you make this thing? Because we'd only ever eaten it at a restaurant. And so you actually take the daikon and you grate it and then you're mixing it with um, some different kinds of flour and maybe some dried shrimp or a special kind of sausage that's like a, a preserved sausage and some seasonings. And then you're steaming that cake and then you slice up the cake after that and then you're pan frying it. So a lot of the most delicious things that I found in Chinese cooking, like the pot stickers, you kind of steam it first and then pan fry it. So they're tender and delicious, but then also have a little bit of that um, golden brown, you know, uh, thing going on from the pan. So if you go to, um, if you go to dim sum, ask for some turnip cake and this is what it will be made out of, but it's not sweet at all. And the purple daikon is really fun. If you look inside, it's got this really beautiful um, purple starburst inside. Um, this one is probably a little more mature than we'd like. It's like pretty big and fat around, but they're really, really beautiful. And so a lot of chefs have started using both the purple daikon, watermelon radishes, some of the different colored radishes to really do a nice presentation on the plate and provide some interest. So I don't know that the, that the purple daikon, I'm not sure if this is actually like traditional to anywhere or if it's just really cool breeding. Um, 
but something I need to learn some more about. But it's very delicious and also not too hard to grow. So, um, but yeah, the daikon radish, um, this is one of those foods that was always kind of considered like a, a comfort food or like a nourishing food. If you're not feeling well, you know, grandma would say, oh, like, let me make you some daikon radish soup. And it would be this really light, plain kind of broth with a daikon radish, some carrots, uh, maybe some ginger, and then, then throw in a couple chopped tomatoes at the end. So not to cook them, but just like a fresh tomato in a very light broth. And it was just really kind of like nourishing, comforting, but not, not too heavy. And it, um, a roasted or cooked daikon radish in a soup is actually very delicious. So the purple daikon, um, I generally do grate them into salad or slice them just for the visual effect. And they do have a really delicious taste. You can also lightly pickle them as a great way to cook them. Um, but generally speaking, I, I will either put bigger chunks in soup, roast them like a potato. You can even roast them along with sweet potatoes and other root vegetables, um, or just grate them into slaws or salads. So you chop them into big chunks? Yeah. The sweet potato on the yeah, on like the I would just, oil? yeah, I would just chop it into a chunk like, you know, okay. like that and toss it with some oil and roast it. My family is from Southern China and Hong Kong. So they moved from the Southern China to Hong Kong. And that's where my mom grew up was in Hong Kong. And then she came to the United States. So um, that's a really good question. Um, I am not super knowledgeable on comparing the Southern to the Northern cuisine. I know that in general, um, the further north you go, you know, there's more emphasis on like wheat noodles, steam buns, things like that. Um, the, you know, the the texture of like the dumplings, like the thickness of the dumpling wrapper is different. There's Shanghai style and there's, you know, Hong Kong style dumpling wrappers and like one's thinner and thicker than the other. But I'm not really an expert on on how to compare the two. Um, I would say growing up, you know, we ate a lot of dishes with um, just a lot of quick stir fries on rice um, with steam whole fish. Um, we would do a whole steam chicken um, that you'd put into a, like dip it into a garlic and ginger, like this ginger paste with oil and salt. Um, we, you know, we did a lot of just vegetables stir fried um, with rice and then, you know, some noodle dishes, but, uh, and some soups, you know, soups are pretty popular, at, like part of every meal. Like a lot, if you go out to eat, there's always a soup served at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I, it's hard for me to just say exactly. I would say, you know, I have been, I have been one time to the ancestral village um, which was called Punyu, and it was very small. Um, and my great grandmother asked my mom where her sons were because she only had daughters. And that was just, I guess, not really good enough at that time. Um, but I've, and I've been to Hong Kong a couple of times, but I haven't really traveled widely throughout the rest of China. So um, let's see. And then we also brought, oh, I also brought, um, shiitake mushrooms. So that was one that was on another part, I think, of the of the list of the different foods. So these growing up, I always saw them dried. I never saw a fresh shiitake mushroom in my house. We would purchase these in big bags of dried mushrooms and then pour some boiling water on it, rehydrate them, and um, then take out the stems because the stems were really woody and tough. So these can be cultivated on logs throughout Florida. Um, people generally harvest oak logs. They may grow on other kinds of trees as well. You drill a little hole, inoculate um, the log, and then keep them moist, and then they grow mushrooms. Oh, inside of the wok? You can cook everything in a wok. You can make fried eggs in here. You can um, uh, saute your bok choy. You can, I deep fried spring rolls in here last night. Um, you can put a little steaming rock and steam a whole fish in here. The wok is like your one pot does everything. Well, and then the radishes, I didn't talk about the um, cultivation. I think I said we direct seed these um, and then uh, radishes are a really great crop because they're fast growing. So the little red radishes, you can get a crop in, you know, 30 days with some varieties. And with the bigger daikon radishes, you know, it could be anywhere from, you know, maybe 45 to 60 days. But it doesn't take a long time to grow a radish. And they're also a great storage crop. So once you take the tops off, you can throw this thing in your cooler and it's going to last for a few months. So it's a really great storage crop. Um, another thing I did want to mention about daikon radish, um, is that it is used to, it's one of the ingredients in kimchi, which is a really hugely important cultural food if you're from Korea. And um, 
we make that here at our, or we make it not at the farm, but we make it using vegetables from the farm. We grow Napa cabbage, um, daikon radish, scallions, carrots, and we've even grown the ginger once. Um, and then you add some garlic and chili flakes or uh, chili paste and some salt and you let that ferment and it creates the most delicious, sour, crunchy, full of probiotic, delicious, uh, you can call it a vegetable, a condiment, whatever you want to call it. Um, but for me, you know, a comfort food meal, a quick comfort food meal is some steamed rice, fry up some eggs in the wok and throw a pile of kimchi on a plate and in a bowl and you're good. So um, it, it, it kind of has, you know, you've prepped all these vegetables and they have all this vitality in them, but you don't have to do it right then. It's all right, all the work's been done for you or you've done it earlier. So um, yeah, daikon radish are definitely uh, used in Japanese cooking, Korean cooking, Chinese cooking. I'm sure there's other cultures as well, but very kind of ubiquitous. Um, so yeah, the shiitake mushroom, um, they're definitely known for the health benefits. They have a lot of different vitamins. I mean, a lot of mushrooms have some unique nutritional properties that other um, vegetable foods don't have. Um, I think it's some D vitamins and a few other things, but the shiitake mushrooms themselves, um, like I mentioned, these we always used to purchase dried. And there was always this weird mythical quality that they had that my grandma would say, oh, these, my grandma would say, well, these, these are really good uh, shiitake mushrooms. And, okay, I'm not sure why that is exactly, but there were definitely certain ones that, oh, these, these are really good and, oh, these don't look so good. And she never really explained to me what the difference was, but she was very picky about them. Um, so these were grown actually, um, these were actually grown indoors, which is not your typical cultivation by a grower named Fungi John, who's down in Orlando, um, that we work with um, because we don't grow any mushrooms ourselves, but we like to get some mushrooms from him. Um, so he does a lot of different varieties that are used for their medicinal purposes, like lion's mane and um, a, a ton of different uh, unusual ones like pink and gold oyster mushrooms. So oh, do I have a little friend? Yeah, the shiitake mushrooms, um, they provide this really uh, savory kind of umami flavor to things and can really um, enhance a dish, I feel like. And it's nice to have dried mushrooms around because then you can have them anytime. You know, it's like they can just be in your pantry. Yeah, the question was about when they're drying shiitake mushrooms, maybe are they adding anything to enhance the flavor? And that is a really good question, but I don't, I do not know. Um, let's see, I also brought, um, sweet potatoes. So this is a hugely important crop to our farm. We grow a ton of sweet potatoes, like not just a ton, probably, you know, 20 tons of sweet potatoes. We have filled a shipping container completely with sweet potatoes. Um, this is a really important crop for us uh, because it is a storage crop. And so we can grow these. We plant them in the summertime. They grow from what's called a slip. So it's just a little piece of the um, vine and we get the slips from a farm in North Carolina um, for different varieties because you need thousands of them at the same time. So we get the slips, you stick them in the ground, they look like, you know, terrible, like these sad little stick of a plant. And then two weeks later, they've leafed out and they look gorgeous. And the sweet potatoes are amazing because they actually thrive in the summer heat. I think, I recommend trying some sweet potatoes, definitely. So they grow on big vines and the vines will climb out. And what's really nice about the sweet potato is once they get established, those vines really cover the ground and suppress the other weeds that can grow. So they're a great summertime crop because they can actually compete with the weeds. Um, we grow multiple different varieties. So this one is your more traditional, um, what in the South, in the United States, we call a yam, but it's not actually a yam. A yam botanically is a completely different plant. So the sweet potato is its own plant that is not related to the Irish potato. So Irish potatoes are actually growing right now, which is in the springtime and we'll be harvesting them soon. And the sweet potatoes grow in the summertime when we harvest them at the end of the fall or like usually around the first frost. So this one is um, tan skin and orange inside. The Murasaki sweet potato is actually kind of reddish or purple skin and is white fleshed inside. And the texture is different. It's um, starchier, fluffier, and even sweeter than the orange sweet potato. And um, this crop, I mean, what I was amazed to learn when I went to the farmer's market is how many people would 
find this Murasaki sweet potato and be really excited because it reminded them of something from home. So I have friends that um, do the farmer's market in St. Augustine that they sell coffee from Kenya, they're from, they're from Kenya. And she always wants to come and get these sweet potatoes because they have these in her um, homeland. And same thing um, in Japan and Korea, they also eat the white sweet potatoes. So we have a lot of um, customers that enjoy finding these varieties that remind them of things that they had at home. You can roast them just like a regular potato. You can um, steam them. These are really excellent steamed. You can put them in soup. I love sweet potatoes and chili, um, like chili and you know, black beans and sweet potatoes. Um, we roast them. I've made mashed potatoes with these. So one of the other crops that grows really well in the summer that was on the list was Malabar spinach. So I don't have that example here right now, but that's another one that grows really well in the heat. And I didn't eat that growing up, but once we started the farm and we we're trying to figure out what can we produce in the summertime, Malabar spinach really thrives on the heat. And that's another one that customers will come up to us at the farmer's market who are from Trinidad and they say, oh, you have poi baji. I'm like, what's poi baji? And you know, they're really excited about the Malabar spinach because it reminds them of home and it's part of the Indian diaspora of people that ended up being in the islands on you know, plantations and they brought their food from home with them. And now they're excited to see it in the new place that they live. So making those connections and hearing those stories, you know, is, is really fun for us. And we learn about the Roselle hibiscus the same way. We were just talking earlier about the different preparations. If you're from Mexico or Egypt or um, Taiwan or wherever you're from, they're using Roselle hibiscus or Mali, but there's different preparations and it's, it's used differently everywhere. Um, turmeric is another one that we grow at the farm. Um, this is not something I grew up using but it's getting super popular now because of its anti-inflammatory benefits. And so we like to use it fresh in tea and curry. Um, I put it in all my broths. Whenever I make a bone broth, I throw in some turmeric. Um, and I think it's just a really excellent uh, supportive, you know, part of your diet that you can add a little bit. It's easy to grow in Florida, any kind of well-drained um, area, part shade to full sun, as long as it's getting plenty of water and can drain. You, know, this, you just stick one of these in the ground and it'll grow. It has beautiful um, foliage, beautiful flowers like ginger. Um, so this is a great one for Florida gardeners. And you can leave it alone for about a year, year and a half, and then dig it up and see what, what it's produced. We decide what we're gonna grow um, based on how things did the year before and also um, what we have space for in our rotation. So we have about 10 years of records now, so we kind of know you know, oh, well, one year we tried, like we did do long beans one year, but then they required trellising. And then we decided we don't really wanna grow anything that requires trellising because it's too much work to put up and take down. Um, so we did that the first year, I think, because we were on a much smaller scale. And then when we expanded, we just stopped doing things that need a lot of trellising. Like we don't grow a lot of tomatoes now. We grow a very small amount of tomatoes because they're very labor intensive and risky with frost and more sensitive to insects. They're just you know, harder to grow. Um, we grow a lot of radishes and a lot of sweet potatoes and a lot of carrots. Um, root vegetables tend to seem to like our soil in general, um, unless we get a ton of rain and then sometimes they rot in the ground, um, which is a problem. <laughs> um, but we generally just try to grow things that have succeeded previously. And every year we try a little something new. You know, we might try a different variety from the seed company, or we may be forced to try something different because the one we want is not available. And that, that is always a disappointment. We're like, oh, that variety was so great. Um, and then they don't have it. Or they send you the variety that it says the same name, but you can tell it's from a different farm and a different source because it grows out completely differently. So you can get an astro arugula that performs very different from year to year, depending on the lot. Um, but yeah, we, we just try to work with our reps at the seed company, what's um, adapted to our area, and, um, and then just keep records and, um, and we rotate, do a lot of crop rotation. So the question was, can you grow turmeric in a container? I haven't personally tried doing it, but I think if you had a container that was, you know, you'd probably need at least a five gallon, if not larger, um, you could give it a try, but it does need a decent amount of sun, like put it in the sunniest place that you have if it's gonna be in a pot, cause I'm guessing it won't get sun all day. And it does need to be watered regularly. So it needs to be watered a lot and have good drainage. Um, but it's worth giving a try. Um, you know, at the very worst, you'll get some pretty foliage. And if it doesn't, if you, after a year or 18 months, if you reach down in the pot and you don't see like 
a big hand produced, it means it's, it's not really happy. It's not going to do much. So, Is turmeric safe for cats? That is a really good question. I don't know of any reason why it would be toxic to any animal, but I also am not an expert on cats. So that's, that's a really good question for indoor planting. Um, I have cats on the farm and they haven't seemed to be interested in it, but other than that, I don't know. So the turmeric, I would say yes, a sandier soil is gonna be better, but we do have a lot of clay on our farm in patches. It just depends. Some areas, the clay is much closer to the surface. Other areas, there's more topsoil on top of it. Um, so the turmeric, um, we've just put in an area that has enough drainage to where it's not gonna, the water won't sit on it. it we do, you do need to put it somewhere the water can drain. We have added a lot of compost um, and also chicken litter. So you can get, like we will get a dump truck full of the chicken litter that they clean from the chicken houses. So that contains the manure as well as probably some, it may contain some shaving material. Um, but that adds a lot of nitrogen and also the composted cow manure has you know carbon as well and we also do um, cover cropping so we plant crops out that we till into the soil um, to add carbon and biomass to the soil and organic matter so